Welcome to Automotive EV. My name is Peter Willing and thank you for joining us. Joining me today is Sanjeev Takyar, Head of Innovation, Solutioning and Strategic Man Marketing for CHEP Automotive and Industrial Solutions. Sanjeev will be delivering a summary of the 11th CHEP Battery in Focus workshop that was held last week. I was privileged to take part in the group last week and I don't envy Sanjeev in condense, condensing four hours of superb content into 45 minutes today. So I will now hand over to you Sanjeev and thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and thank you once again uh, for the opportunity to uh, provide a summary of our working group session that was held last week, um, our 11th one. Um, so this is going to be very similar to the previous summary that we had back in December. So those of you who are familiar with, uh, with attending these events, you'll, you'll know what's coming. Um, so before I begin, um, just a quick summary of what is Battery in Focus and, and why we set it up um, and what have we been doing over the last now three years. So our vision and aspiration is to bring together thought leaders from all aspects of the automotive industry and supply chain industry to discuss and share knowledge to tackle what is one of the fast becoming one of the biggest challenges for the entire industry. And that is the development of safe, efficient and sustainable supply chain for EV batteries. So we invite um, industry experts from, from OEMs, from tier suppliers, from 3PLs, from um, uh, government agencies, from uh, educational industry agencies, uh, institutions as well, to, to come and collaborate and share their thoughts, their updates, their challenges, to have a really open discussion uh, around this very, very interesting and challenging area of the supply, uh, EV supply chain. So we are now into uh, coming up to three years. So this was actually our 11th time that we've had a working group session. So we've had 10 before, before the one we had last week. The first um, six, seven of each, seven um, that uh, were physical um, get-togethers. Uh, unfortunately, since, uh, since March last year, we have had to do this virtually, but I have to say it is working very well. But hopefully, you know, later on this year, if not early next year, we will be able to get together face-to-face. -to -face. Um, and we do try to, you know, in the early ones, try to get together in locations that have really provided additional insights into the supply chain. For example, the sixth one that we held at Frankfurt Airport, where we could actually see air transportation of lithium-ion batteries and how that was being conducted. Each working group session has between four and six uh, guest speakers um, from a variety of, of companies and businesses. And here you can see just a, a summary of, of some of the participants and the topics that we have discussed over the past three years. And really pleased to say that our participation is increasing with every, every event. We have new companies uh, becoming interested and I'm sure that me presenting on this platform is certainly increasing the interest um, as we move now towards the, uh, the industry uh, hockey stick acceleration, as I call it, uh, of EV production. Okay, so what we're going to do now is give you a, a summary over the next half an hour or so um, on what we discussed last week on the 8th of uh, April. Um, we had around 25 participants, uh, again, a, a good number, um, and we had some, some new presenters this time. So here you can see we had our, our update from PwC. Um, from Christoph Sturmer, who gave us a, an overview of what is happening within the industry um, and also some particular 
um, numbers and figures of progression within the EV and battery sector. We were then joined by uh, Benjamin Krieger from, from CLEPA. I'm sure many of you are familiar with CLEPA, the uh, European Association of Automotive Suppliers. Um, and we then had uh, another new attendee, uh, automotive sales company. Um, so Jan Vincent, the CEO of ACC, which is uh, a, a part owned by, by PSA, um, to give us an overview of their challenges and what they're doing in terms of European production of, of battery cells. And finally, we had um, Kuli Malka, who's um, had 33 years within Ford Motor Company um, and has a huge, huge degree of um, experience in supply chain uh, and recently in terms of EVs and batteries to bring his uh, knowledge to this forum. Um, Kuli's now uh, working on an independent consultancy basis. Okay, so let's let's move forward. Um, so in terms of PwC, we focused on three areas. Firstly, uh, an update on the impact of COVID-19 on the, on the industry as a whole. Then moving into the specific um, update on what's happening within the EV market. And finally, how this is affecting uh, the, the EV ramp up, how this is affecting the need uh, around battery capacities and cell production um, within Europe. So the first area we looked at was around the production figures uh, and the sales figures that you see there for Western Europe, North America, uh, and um, other areas, including China, Japan, and South Korea. The overall um, outlook here is that just looking at the first couple of months of February is that demand in Europe is still suffering. Um, and this is predominantly down to the ongoing and prolonged lockdowns that we are facing um, within many of the countries. Um, so sales figures are down upon year upon year. Um, China is now starting to see um, the first base effects against this last year crisis month. So obviously the, the, the effect of um, COVID hit China sooner than it did in, in the other areas of the world. And you can see there that they had a, had a, a big increase in, in sales year on year. But yeah, global production is still failing to recover the lost volumes that we had towards the end of, of 2020. Moving into specific focus then on, on Western Europe um, and looking at what are the predicted scenarios. The summary here is that if you look at the 2020 numbers, they were almost 23% behind what we had in 2019. So that is the overall effect uh, in terms of production volumes um, of, of COVID. And this slow start that we've had in 2021 is going to continue. Um, we will see some increases as the year goes on, um, but the outlook is that the, the full recovery to get up to near 2019 production numbers is going to take us up until the end of 2021, potentially into 2023. So the baseline scenario here that you see by the, uh, with the yellow line, which is PWC's assessment, shows that um, production will continue to suffer uh, with limited interruptions um, in H1 of 2021, some acceleration and recovery in late 2021 and, and into 2022. Uh, which is very close to what they predict as a, as a worst case, uh, which is there from the red line. But there is an upside scenario, which is if we do see a rapid deployment of vaccines, um, like we have seen in, in certain countries, um, we could see um, a rapid uh, economic recovery 
uh, and obviously as a result of that strong demand for for vehicles and production losses from the first quarter of 2021 could be made up into the second half of the year. But this is very much looking at the, um, the passenger car production as a whole. If we move now towards uh, electric vehicles and the electric vehicle market in Western Europe, it's a very different story. New registrations of battery electric vehicles have can what only be described as taken off um, in the second half of 2020 in Europe. And they're now surpassing China in terms of their growth and their market share. So you can see there in terms of the blue line, what we have seen in the last few months. Um, and you know there are several factors around this, which I, I will come on to. But overall, we have seen absolute registrations go up by 10.6% or 216% relative during the first half of 20, uh, during the second half of 2020. And that trend is certainly continuing as we move into 2021. So I will talk about uh, in the following slide some of the factors that are, are accelerating that, uh, that sales and production volume of, of the EV market. Just to highlight um, this impact and, and how this compares with other regions, you can see here on this slide how Western Europe is now becoming the core market in terms of market share for EVs. So if we take together battery electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and hybrids, all of which utilize lithium-ion batteries of some capacity, almost 27% of registrations in 2020 were um, had could be classed as, as electric vehicles in comparison to just over 5% in the US and 7.2% in China. And there you can see uh, on the right hand side that the breakdown uh, and certainly uh, battery electric vehicles will, will con full battery electric vehicles will continue to grow. If we look at one of the, the first aspects of why we're seeing this, this growth, um, it is due to uh, partly due to the continued acceleration of um, an introduction of global incentive programs. So specifically in the US, there is now planned to triple the amount of EV support. Um, we're also seeing ongoing support in countries like Spain, where they are increasing their scrappage program. But there you can see lots of data around the individual countries, both in terms of tax benefits of buying electric vehicles and also purchase incentives. And clearly this is having a big impact in terms of the decisions that people are purchasers are, are making in terms of what type of vehicle they buy next. The second area of impact, which we're all familiar with, is the, the, the EV pipeline. You know, we've seen a huge amount of new, new vehicles come on the market in 2020, and this is going to certainly continue and actually accelerate during 2021. Uh, and here you can see just some of the vehicles over the, the course of this year that are going to be launched. And I think the key point here to highlight is we are seeing some of the main players really coming up with new models that are going to be at the lower end of the market, making EVs far more affordable. And the market leaders are really going to be the VW Group, Stellantis, and the RNM Group. So we are looking at seeing around a 4.1 million increase in production in Western Europe from 2020 to 2025. And here you can just see the, uh, the contribution. So VW Group will, will contribute to around 24% of that, that increase.
So if we look now in terms of the production, where are all these EVs going to be produced? Clearly, capacities are going to increase in terms of the existing um, plants. So we currently have 44 plants. Um, well, we will, we will have 44 plants by the end of this year. And that is due to grow to 69 plants manufacturing fully electric uh, light vehicles by 2025. So again, huge amount of investment from the industry as we continue. But of course, you know, this needs to be supported by the most important component, which is, which is battery, lithium ion battery production. And if we look at the split of the market in terms of battery capacity, so when we talk about battery production facilities, we talk in terms of how many gigawatt hours they are producing. And here what you can see is that the number or, or the percentage of capacity for the different types of storage capacity of different of different types of battery cells. So battery with less than two kilowatt hours will still take over 50% of the market over the next four or five years. Um, but what we do see is, is a growth in terms of the percentage of the batteries that are between 20 and 100 kilowatt hours. And these are batteries that you will typically see within full electric vehicles. But what you can also see is in 2025, we will start to see batteries which have greater than 100 kilowatt hours. So these are going to be batteries which much longer ranges, also powering larger vehicles, specifically in the, in the commercial sector, buses, trucks, for example. Um, and this will have a significant increase in terms of the amount of kilowatt hours that need to be produced. So looking at how these powertrains will, um, will formulate uh, and how that split looks like up until 2030, you can see here that battery electric vehicles will take on a, a predominant increasing role taking over 50% of the market share um, by 2030. Um, and you can see there that the, the main, obviously, area that's going to, uh, going to suffer is going to be the internal combustion engine vehicle. If you look at mild hybrid electric vehicles, that will grow um, slightly, but it's fairly consistent, as are the full hybrid electric vehicles and the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. So it's it's really replacing ICE with the with the um, uh, with the battery electric vehicles uh, is going to be the main the main change that we're going to see over the last over the next nine years. So what does that mean in terms of capacity demand? Well, 112 gigawatt hours is what we're looking to produce, or what the, the battery capacity demand is in 2021, uh, and that will have to grow to 716 um, gigawatt hours, um, sorry, yeah, 716 gigawatt hours by 2030. Um, sorry, that's 1,000 gigawatt hours. So, um, you know, in terms of the number of battery installations, though, uh, that is far, far larger, um, because clearly you can see that most of the batteries are going to be used in, in in terms of the gigawatt hours will be used in terms of the pure battery electric vehicles. Um, so there will still be a lot of battery installations down to mild uh, and full hybrid vehicles. So looking at battery cell production then, um, we currently have, or we will have by 2024, more than 13 major cell production sites across Europe. And here you can just see um, some of the names when they're planned to come online in order to support that, uh, that output that we need. So if all of that happens, um, here we can see in the red, what is the, the capacity demand for electric vehicles? And what is the capacity supply 
including all of those new new battery production sites coming online. Um, and you can see that we do fall slightly short in 2021, but from 2022 onwards, we should, if all of this goes to plan, have enough um, capacity of lithium ion batteries to meet the demands within Europe. Currently, we are very heavily dependent on shipments from, from the Far East. Um, but clearly, you know, the, the shipment and the supply chain of lithium ion batteries is, is very expensive. So we are now looking at uh, this plan and executing this plan is not going to be a simple task. But if we do get it right, we should have more than enough battery capacity to meet the uh, the demand that we are going to see in terms of EVs. So as a very, very quick overview, we actually spent probably about an hour and a half going through, obviously there's a lot of data there, um, but I'll now move on to, to the second area, which was from Klepper to talk about a new battery regulation. So hopefully you're all familiar with Klepper. Um, it's a European Association of Automotive Suppliers represent over 120 global suppliers and 3,000 companies. And what they discussed uh, within the forum last week was around a new battery regulation. So in line with the, uh, the European Circular Economy Action Plan, the European Commission is now revising its battery directive of 2006, and is actually going to be replacing it with a, an EU regulation that's going to be called COM 2020 798. Um, and it's really around the introducing some new requirements around the social responsibility and environmental sustainability uh, for batteries. And its aim is to minimize batteries' uh, impact on the environment in line with the Green Deal, uh, with the objectives of, of strengthening and the, f the functioning of the internal market, ensuring we have a level playing field, promoting a circular economy, and reducing environmental and the social impact of battery production and battery use. So it, the regulation is, is going to be written to cover the entire life cycle, everything from the mining and processing of the raw materials through to the actual manufacturing of the batteries through to its use, and then also, and of course its end of life, which includes recycling and battery refurbishment through to potential second life. Uh, and of course, it's not exclusive to the automotive industry. Um, it covers all types of, of batteries, um, whether they're used for you know, as portable um, products, industrial sector, but of course, automotive and specifically electric vehicles. Four of the key requirements um, that we'd like to highlight are around the carbon footprint. So they're from 1st of July, 2024. Um, every battery supplier and manufacturer will have to make a carbon footprint declaration uh, based on the product environmental footprint. They will have to, all the batteries will have to be accompanied by technical documentation, which demonstrate their, their amount of recycled content uh, which will have a minimum target value. Um, they will need to provide what is going to be called a battery passport for every battery by January 2025. And this, this information will be readily available in a central database um, called the BMS. And finally, there will be uh, a set of performance and durability parameters um, that will be implemented by, by 1st of January 2026 where batteries will be required to meet minimum values. So this proposed inclusion, this proposed regulation is going to make a substantial contribution to a sustainable battery value chain. And the approach to the regulation does have the potential to ensure that we have a level playing field and strengthen the functioning of the internal market. But of course, as this regulation is, is now under review, we do need to ensure that we all contribute where you can and, and have exposure to give inputs to avoid some of the adverse effects that we could see. Um, duplication in terms of regulations, 
barriers to innovation, um, having targets that are, are technically unrealistic, uh, and where we have ambiguity um, and specifically around uncertainty on, on responsibilities within the supply chain. So that was the, the second topic. The third topic um, that we discussed, uh, we had a presentation from ACC, Automotive Sales Company. So ACC are a, a French business, so they were very much focused on the, the French market. And um, of course, you know, they gave some information, as you can see on the slide here, uh, working specifically with uh, being partly owned by, by PSA. Um, what are their, their targets as a business? So in 2015, sorry, 2014, they came from 130 grams, so 110.3 grams, which was well below the, the European target of 130, but now in 2020, needing to meet 95 and then 85, but their target is to meet 75 grams by 2025. So ACC are very much focused in, in aiding PSA achieve that uh, achieve that that target in terms of CO2. And just putting that into into context within the uh, EV market in France, here you can see the growth in terms of um, EV sales, 159% um, uplift from 2019 to 2020. Uh, and for the first time, surpassing 100,000 vehicles, um, EV vehicles being put on the road in France. So, again, looking at who's going to supply um, and you know, the industry being very heavily um, dependent on the, the leading battery manufacturers in Asia. And 85% of the manufacturing production chain is currently in, in Asia. But what is actually coming online, um, there is definitely room to have a major, another major supplier um, for the, the French OEM market. So this is on the basis of why Automotive Sales Company has been created. They have the ambition to be the European leader of automotive battery sales and modules, uh, enabling a clean and efficient mobility. And their ambition. Their ambitions is around being high tech and innovative center of excellence, to be competitive, to produce automotive batteries with that are more affordable, to be clean, clean and green, truly an eco-socially friendly company, and to grow in line with the, the mobility transition uh, to create and creating job opportunities. So ACC, as I mentioned earlier, they were formed very, very recently in the summer of 2020 uh, as a joint venture between SAFT, uh, PSA and Opel. Obviously, PSA um, own Opel. Um, so it was a joint venture between these, these three businesses. Um, but just to highlight, they are not going to be exclusive suppliers to, uh, to PSA and Opel. They are obviously open to supply to, uh, to other manufacturers. Um, they are also part of uh, what's called the important projects of common European interest. And they've also been approved and launched by the European Commission back in, uh, in December 2019. So they have a very strong support um, from government um, authorities including the, the French state uh, and also the, the European Union. So what are they intending to do? Well, they've got four sites in plan. So they already have a, uh, an R&D center uh, in France. Um, they're about to open up a testing plant also located in France near their R&D center. And in 2023, they plan to open their first Gigafactory, also in the north of France, um, with a production capacity of between 24 and 32 gigawatt hours. And then this will be sorted, supported by a second Gigafactory uh, in 2025 with a similar sort of capacity uh, in Germany. 
the amount of investment you know cannot be uh, cannot be undermined. We're looking at an investment of around five billion euros by 2030. So 1.3 billion of that coming from public funding, um, and 3.6 billion coming from private investment. So very very interesting to see you know a newly formed business, um, and I'm sure there will be others like this. But uh, ACC is very much set to become a major supplier within automotive um, battery cell uh, within Europe. The final uh, presentation that we had was from, from Kuli Malka. As I mentioned in my introduction, Kuli comes with 33 years of experience with, with Ford Motor Company um, and has worked very closely with supply chain and specifically around the areas of, of packaging. And what what Kelly wanted to wanted to highlight is there is there is still a huge opportunity uh, and requirement to standardize packaging and provide containers and packaging for those components that are sensitive in um, current vehicles, but also what are going to become increasingly important uh, as we move forward. So in addition to the uh, lithium-ion battery, um, he has highlighted 12 other major components that currently um, do not have an efficient way of packaging um, use uh, to transport them. They are all components that are susceptible to their environment. So they can degrade with time. They can uh, be affected by um, the the weathering, um, water ingress, or shock. Um, so it's very very important that as an industry now we look to the future and how we can create a supply chain and a packaging uh, formulation uh, standardization that can that can make give us a sustainable future. So looking at the main messaging around this, you know, we do have these parts that are sensitive. Um, and it's not just about the, the outer box, which is what a lot of businesses do focus on. It is also about what goes on inside that box. So the internal dunnage. And we still have a lot of waste in our supply chain when it comes to internal dunnage. And therefore, there are lots of opportunities to create some standardized innovative solutions. And there are companies out there today that are innovative um, in terms of internal damage. And we should start working with these businesses to develop smart solutions. The increasing importance of supply chain visibility and track and trace in terms of not just focusing on the location of these, these components and these assets, but also can give us valuable data in terms of the environment that they've been exposed to. So it really is highlighted a call, really a call to action here, um, that as an industry, we should start to collaborate in terms of creating standardized, optimized packaging solutions that can be now be utilized for those 12 components um, moving forward that would then you know, give us a streamlined and more cost-effective uh, supply chain, both from a production and an aftermarket standpoint. During the course of the battery in focus, um, we often like to to hold, you know, questionnaires or, or polls. Um, and in the one in the session that we had last week, we asked the audience a very simple question. Over the next six to 12 months, as battery production accelerates, what do you think is the main challenge for the industry? So here you can see some of the, uh, the responses that we had. We, we asked this question actually halfway through um, during the session last week. And you can see there that we had lots of different responses. But the, the two big ones, which really goes hand in hand with um, what I just went through from, from the presentation from Kuli Malka, um, and the previous um, previous one from Klepper is is concerns and challenge around packaging 
and around regulations. So we are now looking forwards as a, uh, as a group, as a community, about how we can create better collaboration uh, in terms of a call to action to see how we can produce standards around reg packaging and around regulations, even if it's just from an educational standpoint, to make sure that the, the industry is really truly collaborating to take this forward. The final point before I, uh, before I end and, and open the floor up to, to any comments or, or questions um, is that I'm excited to announce that we are now in, uh, in last stage discussions to take the battery and focus event over the waters to North America. So um, in June, um, in the month of June, we should have, be having our inaugural battery and focus event in North America. And I'm sure many of you on this, uh, who are watching this today have um, presence in, in that part of the world. Um, and we'll be delighted to welcome you uh, to that event. So please do reach out to me or to Peter um, uh, via, via all the, the normal forms um, if you would like to participate and join the next uh, event in Europe or, or the event uh, in North America. Okay, so with that, yeah, uh, a very quick run through. And we, like I said, uh, we condensed four hours of discussions into into 35 minutes, um, but hopefully you've found that uh, of, val of value. Obviously, a lot of information to be shared there, but uh, I'll go back to Peter now to see if there's any uh, comments or questions that need to be answered. Thank you, Sanjeev. That was uh, really thought provoking, I'm sure, for a lot of people as well. And uh, I don't know how you managed to cover all that time in, for, in 35 minutes or whatever. Um, one of the, 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 the big interest level is obviously looking at the regulation in terms of packaging. And you're talking about how to get this moving. What, from your opinion, will be the first steps that you need to do to, to get everybody on board on this? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, you know, we've, already, we've obviously, as CHEP, we've been, you know, being a global business, we've, we've already got a fairly good understanding of of some of the the regulations that are available but we're seeing again a lot of um a lot of confusion a lot of ambiguity there are some conflicting regulations as well so and and we by means do not know every single regulation around the world far from it so i think there's definitely an opportunity here that we create some sort of database that we can give companies access to um you know there's there's nothing here to to hide regulations or regulations but clearly i think there's two things here making sure that everybody has visibility and access to this regulations and then potentially having people who are trained up in terms of experts to to come and and give um you know give uh, education to people who are interested in in that uh, in that topic, via you know, um, you know via battery and focus, via separate um, WebExes, and you know even via automotive EV. Um, you know, it's a huge undertaking. Um, I'm sure you know everyone's got a lot on their plate as it is, but I think it's it's really important, uh, and we'll be certainly now discussing that with some of the participants to see how we can take that forward. Would you say that is the first step really getting the key um, global sort of uh, associations, automotive industry action group in the States, uh, ADET, uh, Kleeper and so on across Europe? Um, can't think off the top of my head uh, a Chinese particular equivalent, but mm. <clears throat> that's obviously got to tie in with governmental sort of uh, key areas around it as well. So <clears throat> there's lots to be doing and, and sort of is the first step reaching out to number one, the associations and seeing if they would be prepared to be putting people on board because obviously the associations are made up with or by uh, tier suppliers and, and key players in it. Um, yes. 
What do you do? You see that as 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 the first part, and then government following after, or do they need to run hand in hand? I think I think the associations are are absolutely um, you know it could be a key starting point. You know, if they do have you know, we the, we need to identify where we can find experts that already have you know a lot of the knowledge and that can support this initiative. The, the challenge is going to be about how we coordinate that from a global level. Um, you know, whether any particular regional association is going to be willing to take the helm on that, uh, I simply don't know. But look, I think it's been it's been rightfully identified as part of this working group. And yeah, we will potentially be putting a team of um, experts as a spin off of off the battery and focus to look at how we do that. OK, um, additional sort of uh, cu couple of questions, really. When we, we look at the packaging, uh, packaging aspect and, and not just the regulation, um, how do you do? Can we uh, not be moving air, for want of a better word? Um, you know, it, are there specific packaging solutions that you know of that are really coming in from sort of sell upwards? Um, is it there or, or does it need a lot more work yet? It still needs, it still needs, you know, obviously we have foldable containers and, and so forth, but we're still shipping a lot of air. Um, and I think uh, the main contributing factor to, to eliminate that is, first of all, companies that are collaborating uh, in order to fill, fill trucks. But, but also I think the, the on-time traceability, when we start getting into real smart transport planning, that is what's gonna have the big, the big effect in terms of introducing or, or reducing the amount of air being shipped. That being said, of course, there are, at the moment, the, the supply chain is full of bespoke packaging um, that is, you know, not down to standardized size, so you do not have optimized load fill. Um, and sometimes it's just a case of a few millimeters of difference. So yes, absolutely. In terms of standardized packaging, one of the key contributing factors of that initiative is looking, starting with where does that packaging, how is that package actually transported and where does it actually have to go? What are the sizes of the trucks? What are the sizes of the sea containers? Uh, the transportation that is that it actually needs to go inside. Looking at a, a sort of closer to home aspect, it, you take the the sort of the mining aspect, the sheer miles that's covered in in, in going from mine to vehicle is absolutely colossal. Obviously, we're making ways into that with, with the build up of. Um, our own facilities, which is say the battery cell, uh, as well as the the gigafactories that's coming, but we, we, it's important that we take that extra mileage out of it. So, any thoughts on that? Given the fact that obviously in the UK we now have Cornish lithium, um, but sort of how can we process everything closer to home? Well, I mean the the raw materials, of course, are you know. <laughs> they are where they are, right? So obviously mining efforts do do continue. And for those of you who've uh, been regular um, attendees of this update, you will know that it's a big concern for the industry that I highlighted on uh, on the last session in December, um, where the amount of investment in terms of the raw materials um, is simply not there. And if we if we don't find more raw material, we are going to run out. Um, and we are talking about in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years, not not longer than that. Um, but of course, you know, that investment, you know, we hope will come. Um, it's a huge challenge because you cannot shift, you know, where that raw material is actually mined. Um, and that will will have to have to say, I think, what we are going to have to look at is making sure that we maintain the supply so that that doesn't drive prices up. 
which uh, if obviously those raw materials become scarcer, that will drive up the, the price, uh, which will then have a knock on effect on the price of the batteries and then the price of the electric vehicles and then slow down sales, uh, which is something that nobody wants. Um, so it's, uh, it, I mean, the, the other area here is looking at the incomplete supply chain. Obviously, it's very complex from the raw material all the way through to the battery pack. And there are initiatives going on at the moment whereby they are trying to obviously bring parts of the supply chain within our control closer together. Um, so from, from the cells through to the packs, but also some of you may have heard about the initiative around cell to pack. So actually eliminating the, the intermediary step of, of having to put uh, modules together and assemble modules. Thank you. We've actually uh, run over. Um, I'm sure everybody would like to thank you as much as I can in terms of giving us uh, the insight. Uh, absolutely uh, superb. We have got a question in there regarding standardization being an issue, um, which is actually just coming in now. So um, if you can bear with me. Have we got that back on screen for Sanjeev now? Let's have a look. If you look in the conversation, it would save me sort of reading all the way through it and getting it mistaken. But generally, it's, um, as you mentioned, standardization is an issue that would ease both the regulation, packaging, and also the penetration of EVs. In your view, what are the factors that may facilitate the agreement on standards and what are the main difficulties? <laughs> OK, well, that's uh, no easy question to finish on. That's yeah. not an easy question, very loaded. So um, it's just in the interest of time, I, I'll reply to that. Uh, do we know who it came from? Or Yes, uh, Zami, we will actually send you uh, across if you okay. want to contact him directly with more yes, information. I think that I would understand. probably be... Uh, probably be better because I do have probably several questions back in terms of just understanding uh, a little bit more about that question. Perfect. Well, well sort of thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, Javier, um, obviously you'll get connected back together again via the platform so you could continue the discussion further. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're sort of, uh, you've delivered a lot. So thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you for everyone watching. Um, we've two or more episodes this week uh, within our battery supply chain series. Um, the next one is tomorrow with the recycling and uh, aftermarket use. And then the day after with uh, gigafactories where the, the mining people, uh, as well as British Fault, etc., will all take part in it. So you'll see that on the site. Thanks, Sanju. Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hi, it's Peter again, and thank you for watching the session. Don't forget you can connect with all members within the EV community. Send messages to each other and start to build relationships for the future. Also, take a look at our supplier showrooms. Our partners have got lots of products and services that they have to offer, which again could be of benefit to you. Make the most of the opportunity and thank you again for joining us.